Hey guys, this is a short intro to a series that we're putting out about psychedelics. And it's just so happened that we've ended up with about three pieces at the same time around the same topic. And this, we just want to do a little bit of an intro to it. I think it's also interesting to link psychedelics to what we've talked about on the channel before, because I think the link is maybe not immediately obvious. But a lot of the people we've had on have talked about um, the crisis in meaning. So the meaning crisis, which you could see as a kind of meta crisis that is influencing all aspects of our lives. And a big part of the meaning crisis as well is the crisis of how do we make sense of the world? How do we find truth? How do we communicate with each other? How do we trust each other? Psychedelics are really important, I think, because they can break people out of fixed, small, tunneled uh, cognitive traps. It's one of the reasons they're so good therapeutically. And they can help us to step back from our own ideology and have that space and to be able to think more flexibly if they're used correctly. And they're not always used correctly, but they have that potential genuinely to break us out of these tribalized ideological camps that we're in now where we can't talk to each other. There's no good faith conversation. We're not meeting each other fully from a place of um, genuine uh, interest and you know, trying to get somewhere together. Psychedelics have that potential, but it requires a lot of work and a really solid framework around them. And we don't really have that yet. Yeah, and it's fascinating that this psychedelic renaissance is happening in the middle of this meaning crisis. And I think the two are definitely linked. You can go back to the sort of really high profile debates between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. You could argue that's about the meaning crisis as well. Like, how do we make sense of the world? Do we need a, do we need a religious framework to do so? The one thing that they do agree on is the value of psychedelics or the importance of psychedelics. Sam Harris has written a lot about how meaningful he's found his psychedelic experiences. Jordan Peterson hasn't talked openly about his own psychedelic experiences, but he has, at the core of his Maps of Meaning lecture, is a lot of talk about the value of psychedelics, the importance of psychedelics, the fact that they show there is the mystery of consciousness, there is this experience that materialist science has no idea how to process whatsoever but can be very meaningful, very, very therapeutic. And it's, it's also replicable and is an, experience, is an experience of the mystery, the divine, or something that can be reliably replicated in people and we have no, not even any framework for. So regular viewers to the channel might know that this is something that we've both been interested in for quite a while. Uh, I've done pieces about it for the BBC and for Channel 4 News going back about... first one was in about 2008, so I've been following this story for quite a while. What's really interesting about the films that we're putting out now is that there feels like there's a real shift. So for a while, the, the enthusiasm was about psychedelic, the psychedelic renaissance, that these substances were being used as medicines. Somehow the films that we're putting out are a little bit more cautionary. There are, but I think that reflects where the conversation is at right now among people in the psychedelic community who are still very enthusiastic about the potential of psychedelics for medicine and for cultural transformation, but are also feeling like, whoa, 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 we've got to be careful here. And I think we'll talk about the different areas of that, um, but maybe we'll talk a little bit about our kind of backgrounds first. Yeah, so... Around the same time you were covering that for the BBC, I, I wrote a novel um, around psychedelics. And it was, a, you know, I'd say psychedelics were one of the most formative um, things in my development and in my life. And I had an article in The Guardian, which got some really angry comments actually underneath it at the time. It's also 2009. And then I'm one of the organizers of a, um, a conference called Breaking Convention, which happens every two years. It's around psychedelic science and culture. It's been growing and growing as well. So my own personal trajectory has also been one of extreme excitement into <laughs> extreme caution and then up into kind of a hopeful excitement, but tempered with caution because I've seen... Uh, I've seen lots of different ways people have used psychedelics, lots of ways they've used them that would have been better had they never taken them at all. I've seen a lot of ways in which it has not impacted the culture like, it, like they could have. Um, and so there is, I, I think I'm probably not the only one in, you know, in the community who feels like that around them. So we're putting out three pieces. One is called Magic Medicine, question mark, uh, asking the question whether they are whether they can be used effectively as medicines. 
So there's been a, a, a lot of research done in the UK, in London, at Imperial College around psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, being used for depression. And the idea being that it can get us out of rumination, it can get us out of um, habitual ways of thinking that are characteristic of depression. And a camera crew was allowed in to the end of the first pilot study and captured the experience of three people. And what's interesting about that film is that it, it shows a very mixed picture, a very mixed picture. So it's, it's something of a cautionary tale. And so we've got some clips from that film and then an interview with the director and with the, 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 the psychologist who led many of the, se the sessions was sitting in there with uh, the, the participant. At the end of the day, when they're talking through their experience, you're left with this profound sense of respect for the process, that that person's unconscious mind was somehow able to take them on this journey back towards some kind of health, or a journey with a step in the direction of balance and health. We've also got a piece with Gabor Mate called Psychedelic Therapy. So we then got an interview with Jamie Wheel, who we've had on the, the channel before, expert in flow states, and he, he's really sounding the alarm on where the psychedelic renaissance is at right now and the dangers of big pharma coming in, of narcissistic, kind of the, the, the dark side of psychedelics that can lead to narcissistic inflation. And he's pretty much saying he thinks the, that the psychedelic renaissance is headed off a cliff. He's pretty clear about that. He says that the, the forces in play already are unstoppable yeah. and that's where, that's where it's going. And then also Gabor Mate, the Canadian doctor who works a lot with addiction and he talks about how it can be used, how psychedelics can be used to treat addiction. I think I'm actually far more pessimistic and concerned actually, uh, in ways that I didn't even anticipate coming out of Stephen. Those are just the factors I'm watching, you know, and, and, and I would imagine that, um, I mean, A, they're all already happening. So none of this is sort of, um, you know, Cassandra, you know, uh, imagining worst scenarios and saying, well, what if that happens? These are all already happening. The question is just where do they lead us? I think it's really interesting, Jamie's points, you know, when I listened to them resonated a lot because the, he talks about this kind of psychedelic narcissism and this kind of Instagramification of the psychedelic experience that people are like, hey, I'm in Peru drinking ayahuasca. And, and there's just the lack of structure and the lack of integrity that a lot of people working with those uh, plants are showing. Um, and it's just, what, what struck me is that psychedelics traditionally and through shamanism are so different in the, the way they were used to the kind of um, me, 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 narcissism culture. You know, it was very much a case of, like, a big part of the psychedelic experience is, is being able to sit with pain and to be able to go through an experience that is not glamorous, that is not something you want to share, that has actually traditionally been sacred, so you don't share it around. It's even the Eleusinian mysteries, which used to happen in ancient Greece, where, um, you know, they almost certainly used a psychedelic substance. You weren't allowed to talk about it at all with anyone. And the one, one man was, uh, you know, uh, there's a, a record of someone doing it in his house for his friends. And that was like punishable by death, you know. So just the, the sheer contrast of how psychedelics have been used and what Jamie Wheel is talking about with this narcissistic um, appearance only culture is, is a bizarre state of affairs to be in. So I think we've both had this sense for quite a while of when is it going to break through and become more mainstream? and feeling, oh, it's now, it's now, it's now, and it definitely has now. I mean, we're in the middle, I think everyone would acknowledge we're in the middle of the psychedelic renaissance. Yeah. If the, the original psychedelic um, wave was the 1960s, we're back in the renaissance, and I think the, the publication of Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, was a, a big moment there. But the, the conversation has definitely shifted, and now the conversation is, are we in danger of replicating some of the mistakes of the 1960s where we had this huge exuberance around it and then the, the, the dark side of psychedelics came in more and more and it, it became increasingly undeniable as to that dark side. We realized as one of the, the people in, in the films that we're putting out talks about them, they are non-specific amplifiers. And this is something that a lot of enthusiasts about psychedelics don't necessarily acknowledge. They're not, they will amplify anything that you're feeling, and by definition, they'll amplify everything in the culture as well. And it's not, 
it's not necessarily just a positive thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's good to also step back about 40,000 years to the original psychedelic renaissance. Arguably, was, you know, there was a big shift in uh, human beings and our capacity to make art, make culture, and some have linked that to increased use of, in psychedelics. And even John Verveke has talked about this a couple of times as well, the role psychedelics have played in our development as a species. Um, and it's very rare that psychedelics are just in the entire culture. It's really rare. John Verveke talks about this really well around, you know, it still tended to be only a few people were taking them though. The shaman would take the psychedelics and be able to tap into a different way of seeing, be able to connect patterns together that no one else could and go, hey, the bison are moving that way tomorrow. People would be like, how the hell does he know that? Because he knows. Shaman actually means he who knows, or she, he or she who knows, person who knows. So you have access to some information, but not everyone had access to the information. So at the risk of putting out a very, very unpopular opinion, I've come to the uh, conclusion, not conclusion, but I wonder often whether psychedelics should ever become mainstream or whether they should be used um, after training. Like, you know, we don't let everyone just drive a car who wants to or pilot a plane. There's a training process that is involved in that. And that's the way it's been for a very, very long time. In fact, that's the way we figured out as a species how to use psychedelics safely. So that's an open question for me. Are we playing with fire? So if you look back at the 60s and the first sort of psychedelic wave, you see this incredible level of creativity. You see the level of like, the music that came out at the time was heavily Im influenced by it. It was this kind of liberation of creative energy for sure. I also question whether they are playing exactly the same role as they did in the past. And there's a sort of a sense of there were, there were a lot of kind of mental straitjackets to break out of in the 60s that I'm not entirely sure are the same nowadays. And what I've perceived in the psychedelic community is a lot of, actually a lot of groupthink, a lot of very, very similar perspectives, like the idea there's a kind of narrative in the psychedelic community which is, yeah, everyone else is following this kind of corporate programming and free your mind with psychedelics and then you'll be kind of be able to see through the patterns, you'll be able to see what's really going on, which tends to degenerate into outright conspiracy theory a lot of the time, like huge amounts of conspir conspiratorial thinking within the psychedelic community and very similar conspiratorial thinking as well which is sort of, I think, is, is mostly a projection of sort of internal stuff out onto the world, unresolved internal stuff out onto the world. But also even the, there's very little political diversity in the psychedelic community nowadays, which if psychedelics were kind of, um, had the effect of freeing our minds, you would expect more diversity, not less. Mm. Whereas I think what it often does is becomes a bit of an induction into a, into a way of thinking about the world that seems very, it's another form of groupthink. Yeah, and, and uh, that, there's a phrase that psychedelics are non-specific amplifiers, which comes from Stanislav Grof. And if you are in an environment that is a certain way and you take a psychedelic, it you know, has a certain amount of preconceptions about the experience, has a certain political leaning, it is most likely that that will be enhanced in you. So it can create its own filter bubbles very powerfully. I mean, it's also an open question for me, this point about political diversity. I don't think I've met, uh, maybe 0.1% of the people I've met in the psychedelic community are not quite left-leaning. I mean, it's really like, it's, it's almost impossible to find someone who isn't. Um, so that, is, that begs the question of, okay, either it's that point I just laid out, that is re self-reinforcing, or is there something about the psychedelic experience itself that lends itself to, for example, social constructivism, which, which arguably it could in a certain context because the psychedelic experience does deconstruct and does give you the sense of there's multiple different narratives and frameworks and I can kind of see, which is true anyway, but also that if that's not tempered by a kind of grounding in truth, it can just go haywire into what you were just talking about, conspiracy theory, group think and unfortunately that's where I've seen it going. So yeah we're putting out films about psychedelics they're all a bit of a downer um, but I think that's where the conversation is at right now I think it, it is that is pretty much the cutting edge of the conversation there's still a lot of enthusiasm and potential for um, psychedelics that a lot of people in the community are feeling but increasingly I think many of the people in the psychedelic community I'm aware of are kind of feeling a little concerned about some of the ways that things are going.
Yeah, and rightly so. And this is a natural part of the process. As something goes through a, rev a revival, then all of the shadow material, I think, as well, all of the dark side of it, also needs to be looked at. Um, and I think it's essential because they are they are incredible um, substances if used in the right way, and they do have incredible potential. But I think. Uh, Everyone who's involved with them needs to, to kind of show up and grow up around them. So we'll be putting up the other films over the next few days and do enjoy them, comment on them, let us know what you think and see you soon.